Report from Santa Fe is made possible in part by grants from the members of the National Education Association of New Mexico, an organization of professionals who believe that investing in public education is an investment in our state's economic future. And by a grant from the Healy Foundation, Taos, New Mexico. Hello, I'm Lorene Mills, and welcome to Report from Santa Fe. Today we're doing a very special program about death penalty issues in New Mexico. And I'm honored to have today two wonderful guests who have worked so long and hard on this issue. First, we have Representative Gail Chasey, Democrat from Bernalillo County. You worked for how many years to... Well, we worked for 10 years in, in order to get the death penalty repealed in New Mexico in 2009. And thank you very much for that. We also have Marcia Wilson, a retired attorney in Santa Fe. But tell us a little about your background and, and the, the, the piece of scholarship that you did that's so important to this issue. Well, I, um, I was an attorney. I retired in 2003. And before I, got re before I was retired, I got involved in a state bar task force on the death penalty. And it became apparent that no one knew how many death penalty cases there had been or where they were filed or what the outcome was. And so I started trying to find them all. And after I retired, I continued doing that and eventually found all the these cases and wrote an article that was published in the New Mexico Law Review about how the death penalty was applied in New Mexico. And, and it is kind of the go-to piece about this. And, uh, you know, people need constantly to, to understand the scope of this. So if you could give us, well, let's take a moment now to give us a little of the historical background. How many cases have there been? How many executions have there been? What do people need to know about the application of the death penalty in New Mexico? And your work was from 1979 through December 2007. It was used in the law that repealed that abolished the death penalty in 2009. But And so you can kind of update it for us, too. That's a huge thing I'm asking of you, please. Well, um, there were, New Mexico has never been all that enthusiastic about the death penalty. And the last execution in this state, the last forcible execution, was in 1960. Terry Clark dropped his appeals and allowed the state to execute him uh, in, I believe it was 2001. That is a volunteer. He volunteered to be executed. Other than that, between 79 and 2009, there were 217 death penalty cases filed cases in which the prosecution actually sought the death penalty. There were 15 men sentenced to death. That's 7% of the cases. Um, there were a lot of different kinds of situations in which the prosecution sought the death penalty. and. I mean, the thing that strikes me, the death penalty is very expensive. New Mexico never did a cost study, but every state who has done one has found that it's multiples of what it costs to prosecute a regular criminal case, a regular case without the death sentence at stake. And in New Mexico, Justice Mason estimated it would be six times as expensive as a death penalty case, excuse me, as a murder case in which death was not a possible sentence. And can you speak to the, this is one of your main issues when you brought this before the legislature time and again, is the actual cost of these cases? 
And well, interestingly, when we first were introducing the bill, the Speaker of the House would give it a referral to the House Appropriations and Finance Committee as one of the committees to um, examine the policy of eliminating the death penalty and replacing it with a sentence of life without possibility of parole. <clears throat> What ended up happening is, the, in the end, because of the fiscal analysis of the legislation, it had a positive impact on our budget. So the Speaker of the House stopped referring it to the House Appropriations Committee. Um, Max Call had been the chair, and he had his um, fiscal people had looked at it and they said, this is going to save the state money to abolish it, and therefore it doesn't really need to come before the Appropriations Committee. Um, there have been estimates by the Public Defender's Office. As, as Marcia said, we didn't actually do a cost study, but the estimates range from at least two million to four million a year that um, would be saved just by not having it on the books. Because once you charge um, a case as a death penalty case, the costs immediately um, are attached to that prosecution. And you know, one of the things that uh, related to that kind of a cost is the, the human cost, the mm. personnel costs. Representative Mo Maestas speaks very eloquently about the time that he served as a prosecutor in Bernalillo County, and there was a very high profile. Uh, death penalty case underway. Um, I, I can't think of the name, but it was uh, it w involved a, a murder, and of course, was it the Astorga case? It, it, no, it wasn't. The Astorga case came after the death yeah. penalty, oh, okay. but um, what it was the Gurley Hassan Croft. Mm. I'm, I'm not sure if I've got the last yeah, name right. It's okay. But what, what Representative Maestas said is that the top prosecutors in the district attorney's office had to put all their other cases on hold, and we're talking violent crimes against the community, and those were stacking up or given to um, less senior, less experienced prosecutors, and they did nothing else for over a year. So what you've done is you've actually reduced the um, prosecution of other important crimes simply because of the cost in human terms of seeking the death penalty. And, and I agree with that. I think the problem that people don't understand is that in order to get the, the small number of death sentences, all of which, by the way, were, were with the exception of Terry Clark, none of them actually ended with an execution. But to get that small number of death sentences, you had to file 217 cases. It doesn't work any other way because, the, as Gail said, the costs are all front-loaded costs. The costs of getting the experts for trial, the costs of uh, more attorneys being involved, more hearings being involved. It's a much more complex thing. And that is why the cost goes up so much. It's not just, oh, death is one possible sentence. The fact that it is death quite appropriately requires additional safeguards, and that takes time and money. And that's under our U.S. Constitution and our state constitution. We don't simply say, this crime is so horrible, the Constitution doesn't apply. <laughs> Otherwise, we could take people who are um, accused of and who very likely did perpetrate horrific crimes and just, you know, hang them next week, as was done back in territorial days. Um, that was swift justice and sure and, and may have served a greater deterrent <laughs> than, than now. The research shows that the death penalty does not provide a deterrent. Let's talk about why this is up now. Uh, in August of 2016, Governor Martinez said that she was going to push for the reinstatement of the death penalty. And people, there have been very heinous 
child murders and cop murders, and people get very emotional and very passionate, and they want to do the worst thing possible to the perpetrators of these crimes. But why is that the wrong answer to the wrong question? Well, I think that what happens is we are all heartbroken and deeply, deeply concerned about these terrible tragedies. All we, the easiest thing to say is those people ought to be, ought to receive the ultimate punishment immediately. Well, we know immediate isn't a possibility in our criminal justice system yeah. because of the constitutional protections. Mm -hmm. But the worst possible sentence, I think we would agree. There are people who should not walk among us. And I don't want to minimize the tragedies that have occurred. As a, an attorney who practices in the area of abuse and neglect cases, I, I couldn't even read the story of what Victoria went through. I, I couldn't listen to it on TV. I, I live this, um, but certainly not to that degree, on a daily basis in, in representing children in abuse and neglect cases and sometimes representing parents who were working to be reunited with their children. But my focus is on what do we do to prevent this ever happening again, I think we need a blue ribbon commission. I'm going to be asking our leadership to call for this. Something in, along the lines of the 9-11 commission or the Challenger explosion that we, we have to look at, this can't continue to happen. And what do we need to do? After Omari Varela died, you know, CYFD changed its practices, but as a legislator, I never knew what their internal investigation revealed, so that as a policymaker, I couldn't address it. And I think there, those cases are protected, the details, but we need to really examine our whole system. There are a number of states that are front-loading the system. They're investing early to prevent child abuse and neglect. Um, I haven't been able to get that effort started in New Mexico. The Legislative Finance Committee is interested in it. I have introduced legislation. I had the deputy director as my expert witness, along with the Pew Foundation, and I can't get anywhere in this current structure with the uh, Republican leadership in the House of Representatives. Yeah. And I think that is so important because, I mean, I, I sympathize with that feeling of, oh my God, we've got to stop this. But the way to stop it is to address those issues directly. There are things that we can do to make police officers and law enforcement officers more safe when they're on the job. And with, with the subject of child abuse, home visitation, lots of programs that work with parents when the children are very young and prevent it in the first place. You know, I. I think that people like the death penalty because it seems like such a simple answer. And it's not. It does not do anything to prevent the problem. Really, it's, it's expensive and ineffective. Also, with regard to the killing of our police officers, which has been, um, again, a heartbreaking and uh, just a terrible terrible problem to address. One of the op-eds in the Las Cruces paper, and I think it was run also in um, Albuquerque as well, but an attorney from that area of the state taking the cost of a death penalty case actually figured out that the cost of a single death penalty case would pay the annual salaries of 50 Doña Ana sheriffs. So Doña Ana County could have more personnel. They could have better equipment, they could have better investigatory tools that would actually do more to prevent the killing of a police officer or a county sheriff than reinstating the death penalty. Well, we're speaking today with Representative Gail Chasey and with Marsha Wilson. Thank you so much for your insights into this. So, Marsha, you, in your research, you've shown how much these cases cost. And the state is in this fiscal crunch. Um, we could pay for more people in CYFD. We could pay for more child welfare. We could pay for more home visits. 
the amount of money, like you say, to, to, to pay for 50 more officers in a year, and who knows how many more child welfare specialists, what do you see? Um, how, how can we get that across to people? I guess we just have to keep saying it over and over because I'm certainly not the only person saying this. Um, there are plenty of people who have noticed that increasing the punishment does not actually prevent crime. It really doesn't. I know people sit at home and think, well, you know, if I knew there was a death penalty, I wouldn't do a crime like that. But, you know, that's not what people are thinking when it happens. Especially when they're doing these crimes of insanity. No one is thinking about a Ben Franklin list of pros and cons. Indeed. And, you know, and, and I think in one of your testimonies, you had said that they asked all the chiefs of police nationally. You want to tell us what that result right. was? Right. This is very common um, survey that occurs, uh, and I used this when we were working on the uh, repeal of the death penalty in the past. When you survey the chiefs of police across the country and you ask them to rank order the things that will help make their community safer, the death penalty is last on their list every single time. I was on a panel at the international, um, an international forum on the repeal of the death penalty, and a chief of police in New Jersey served on the panel with me, and he had been a former supporter of the death penalty. In fact, he wasn't opposed to it in, in moral principle or for ethical reasons, as many are. He was just um, opposed because of the fact that it, it is completely ineffective on keeping our community safe and because it was so expensive. And chiefs of police would rather have more personnel. They would rather have better investigatory tools. They would be rather have better safety equipment, better cars, better um, methods to communicate with one another in our sparsely populated state, it's sometimes really hard with satellite coverage for them to be reliably in touch with each other when they're in those remote areas. Those are the kinds of things that law enforcement needs. That's what I believe and that's what they have told us. So it's a knee-jerk reaction. It's very, I think it's very cynical. I think it's because it generates emotion. A lot of people are so misinformed because we haven't talked about it in, 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 in quite some time. Uh, we talked about it a lot in 2009, or for 10 years we talked about it a lot. I think people forget that if we were to pass a law to have the death penalty reinstated, all of these crimes that have just been committed wouldn't be punished by the death penalty. So these people who have just broken our hearts and outraged our communities, rightfully so, would not be subject to the death penalty. Only once it's in effect would a crime committed uh, result in a sentence of death, which is in 7% of those brought, if that's we go with our last um, averages. And yes. our, our murder rate declined after we um, passed the Yes. Repeal after we repealed the death penalty and replaced it with life, life without parole. So it, it's not a rational response. It's not an informed response. It's not a studied response. It's not looking at the evidence and saying, where does the evidence take us? In fact, frankly, it seems like it's a political move and very cynical and um, I think betrays our trust in public officials. It, to me, it's when you're in the middle of a serious budget crisis and every single day this state is going deeper and deeper into debt, and then to come up with, oh, well, we're going to try and reinstate the death penalty. Well, you know, you're just going to make the crisis worse. That's what it's going to do is make it worse. Because if you're going to do that, then you need to put more money into courts, which the governor is not particularly fond of funding these days. Uh, you're need, going to need to give more money to the law, law office of the public defender, and you're going to need to give money to prosecutors. These are expensive cases. 
And, and I, w I was going to uh, say, actually, we've just, um, just in the last week, have been told that the Law Office of the Public Defender needs $5 million more to get through this year. You know what's going to happen if they don't have money to represent criminal defendants? They're going to be released. Now, how does that make our community safer? If we don't give the courts adequate money, then the, um, the I do the court-appointed attorney work, and the child, um, the CASA program, where volunteers go into the courts and try to help follow these cases and advocate for these children, those are likely to lose funding. We've had a, an email from the director of the uh, CASA program in Valencia and Sandoval County saying, we know we're going to be cut if the courts don't receive the funding that they need. So this would be such a waste of resources when even now we can't afford to pay our juries or our grand juries and we hardly pay them anything. But now we can't even pay them that. And even fines like the Secretary of State office was ordered to pay fines for a, a bad call that they made. Right. They say, oh, there's no money. We have to really, this state is in a fiscal crisis. We have to absolutely prioritize how to get the most bang for the tiny amount of money that we have. This, you know, economically, just the fiscal aspect of this back, makes it a no-brainer. Back in 2009 and, and for the years preceding that, uh, those who were opposed to the repeal of the death penalty would say, we can't put a price on justice. You know, as legislators, we have to put a price on everything. We put a price on education. We put a price on higher education. We put a price on justice. When you're saying to the courts, you can't have this, the budget that you need, you're putting a price on it. When you're saying to the public defender, you cannot have the, this money, you're putting a price on justice. This is what we do. We have to do it. And it's, it's really a mixed message from the executive that we only need a one-day session because we're going to just shave every single budget to saying, let's, ha let's discuss the repeal, uh, reinstatement of the death penalty in our one-day session when it took us 10 years to get it passed, with two-thirds of the state in agreement with replacing the death penalty with life without possibility of parole. I think people just haven't been informed lately. They're so heartbroken and enraged over these recent crimes. They, they think, well, if that would they think it was going to actually stop these crimes. And it won't. It simply won't. It makes it more difficult to prevent these crimes. That's all it does. So, and that is why I asked you both here, because mm -hmm. we have to, you know, constantly bring this back. People are governed by their emotions, and these are righteous emotions. Mm -hmm. It was so tragic what happened. But we have to, you know, balance reason and emotion and look at the best way to use our resources. And if the, the best way to use those millions that would go to the appeals of a death penalty judgment could go to CYFD with, with you know, child welfare visits. And when someone is, is reported, when there's been a, a child that's been flagged a couple of times and still nothing is done that results in the death of that child, maybe we should put the money into checking out these reports rather than after the exactly. fact. Exactly, yeah. exactly. And I guess I, I wonder um, what we are doing talking about this when our focus should be entirely on the budget and how we can best meet our, um, our immediate needs and look to the future on having a responsible budget because we don't do deficit budgeting in New Mexico. It's, it's not allowed by our Constitution. But, you know, there, what, what's really heartbreaking to me, in addition to all of this, these difficult and, and um, um, unforgivable tragedies is the fact that we were on a path in New Mexico of criminal justice reform. And this 
criminal justice reform in New Mexico was not a partisan issue. We had brought in the House and the Senate. It was a subcommittee of the committee I chaired, which was the Interim Courts, Corrections and Justice Committee. I, I should say co-chaired, because it's a co-chair with the House and the Senate. We had a subcommittee on criminal justice reform. We brought in some leading figures from red states, from Texas and from South Dakota. And this is something that um, nationally, the Republicans and Democrats have worked together on. In fact, I don't align myself much with the Koch brothers, but they have supported criminal justice reform. There's a, a group called Right on Crime. Carl Rove has been active in this group. So it's um, active in Texas, it's active in a number of red states. What they have decided they need to do and we've talked about this here, is we need to lock up dangerous people. There are those who should not walk among us. And the others need to have punishments that fit the crime, but if they're not dangerous, let's not spend our money on keeping them in prison. Let's not build more prisons. Let's put our money into prevention. And so they're doing that in Texas. They're doing that in uh, South Dakota, a number of other states. We had, until the 2014 election, we were working on that in New Mexico, and we had the support of the Pew Foundation. We unfortunately never had the governor's buy-in. And for that reason, the Pew Foundation wouldn't fund the effort. Mm. They want all three branches of government. We had the courts, we had the legislature, but we didn't have the governor. I, I guess what I object to is that when things become so politically divisive, as they did after 2014 and the Republicans took over in the House of Representatives, um, it killed good policy. It's happening now um, at the national level. There's a criminal justice reform bill that's being pushed by Senator Durbin and Senator Grassley. Who, Grassley's a Republican from Iowa, Durbin is a Democrat. But it's on hold now because of this bitter presidential debate. Mm -hmm. And it's really a shame because we are not enacting good public policy because of political divisiveness. And I can only think that the um, call to reinstate the death penalty is political in nature, and it is, um, that is a horrible disservice to our state. Well, we're gonna have to leave it there. Uh, Marcia, I'm hoping, yeah, you're, I was hoping we could get to the Women's Justice Project. Maybe we'll do it in the future, because it's something you're, you're working on that's very important, too. But I'm so grateful to the two of you for taking the time to come and talk about these important death penalty issues. Our guests today are Representative Gail Chasey. Thank you for joining us. You bet. Thank and Marcia Wilson, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. And I'm Lorene Mills. I'd like to thank you, our audience, for being with us today on Report from Santa Fe. We'll see you next week. Report from Santa Fe is made possible in part by grants from the members of the National Education Association of New Mexico, an organization of professionals who believe that investing in public education is an investment in our state's economic future, and by a grant from the Healy Foundation, Taos, New Mexico.